Amen. Come on, some. Good to see you all this morning. I love, 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 love being here. Good morning. Good morning. I don't know if you know this, Chris is the administrator of the church, and he likes to keep it at a certain tip, but apparently he's really changed, because Janice is now talking about how he's tipping people, and the Chris I remember was pretty stingy, so clearly, unless that was a joke, was that a joke? Chris is a tipper? Oh, amen. God is good. I tell you, Chris has still got the first dollar he got for allowance back when he was six. <laughs> Man, I miss you guys so much, and uh, it's always good to be with you. I'm dressed like this because Hazel and Nate are on their way to Hawaii, and this is the closest I've ever gotten to Hawaii in my life. <laughs> I did hug Ron Aradonis, and so I guess that got me a little closer. <laughs> it is good to be with you. Um, that song was awesome. I love Davion singing. I love it. But we got to do a song, because, you know, I can't come here and not do a song, right? Somebody pray for me. Had me on their mind. Took a little time and prayed for me. Well, you know they got down on it. You know that I'm so glad they. Don't you know that I'm so glad they prayed for me? Don't you know my sister prayed? You know she. That old girl, she took a little time and prayed for me. Don't you know she, you know that I'm, Lord, you know that I'm so glad she prayed for me. Don't you know my brother prayed, you know he, that old boy, he, Come on, thank you, brother. Don't you know he, you know that I'm, Lord, you know that I'm so glad he prayed for me. Don't you know my preacher prayed, yeah, you know he, took a little time and prayed for me. Got down on his knees. I'm so glad he prayed. I'm so, oh, I like this part here. Don't you know my Jesus prayed? You know he, thank you, Jesus. Turn this one off. Got down, turn this off. I'm so glad they pray. I'm so glad he prayed. For one more time, don't you know my Jesus prayed for me? Took a little time and prayed for me. Got down on his knees. I'm so glad he prayed. I'm so glad he prayed for me. You may be seated. We're going to be in 2 Kings today. Is this mic a little hot? Can you turn this down a little bit? That'll be helpful. 
I'm pretty loud and obnoxious, so trust me, they're going to be able to hear me. <laughs> Appreciate the brother on the uh, sound this morning. What's, your na- what's his name? Good to see you, Jason. Appreciate you. Well, like Dan Rice, Dan Rice, geez, where am I going with that? Like Dan Schrader, I want to thank you all, church. Thank you for a great day yesterday. Yeah, that's just, uh, I can go on and on, but uh, just thank you. Thank you for making yesterday super special for my family, making it special for my wife and I. On behalf of my whole family, I want to thank you again. Uh, Yesterday, family, you experienced our church family on full display. All the service, everything, the cleanup. We do weddings well, so thank you so much, Columbia Church, again. And so uh, I'm going to talk this morning. You know, I I, um, wasn't sure what I was going to preach on. Janice goes, hey, will you preach? And Hazel said, no, Dad, don't preach. I'm going, why can't I preach? She said, you just don't need to. I'm going, you're not even going to be there. Why do you care? (laughs) But she was pretty insistent that I not preach today. So it just kind of got me to wondering. I don't know why, so I'll have to figure that out with her later. But uh, Janice said, hey, I don't want to bug you too much. I said, it's not a problem at all, bro. It's never Never bother for me to preach in Columbia. And so I was trying to think what I was going to preach on, and I uh, had a sermon that I preached. Something that's really been on my heart, something I've been studying out a lot, is this idea of being a victim, victimhood. And so I've been, this has sort of been a constant theme that's been coming up, and because I suffer from this idea, self-victimization a little bit as well. And so I, you know, I kind of had a couple of sermons I was going to preach, and I was having a conversation with Rob Milner yesterday, and he brought up the word victim, and I thought, that's it. That's what I need to talk about. And so I'm going to look at a familiar story to us in 2 Kings chapter 5. It's the story of Naaman, and the title today is Overcoming Our Victimhood. Overcoming Our Victimhood, which I tell you, we can always use probably a good study on this of overcoming our victimhood. I don't know if you, but like me, I struggle a lot with self-victimization. Now, this is not at all to say that we have not been victimized in one way or another in our life. There are legitimate victims. There are things that have happened in your life that, that, uh, that have happened to you. But you know, it's always about our perspective and our prayer life, okay? But it's always about that, our perspective on what's happened to us. And I tell you, sometimes we can take the things in our life that have happened, whether it's trauma or something, and and honestly, we can ruminate over so much, play it over so much in our mind that we actually re-traumatize ourselves over and over and over again. You ever been there? And so I know I can do that to myself at times. And I'm sure that maybe you've done that, or you know someone. So even if it doesn't apply to you, I'm sure you know someone. Let's just say you know someone who's trying to overcome their victimhood. And hopefully we'll get three, at least three things out of this passage today that will help us overcome our victimhood. Let's go to God in prayer. God, you are amazing. Thank you, Jesus, that you do pray, that you did pray for us. And you have us on your mind, and that's, that is really, it's, it's, it's hard to imagine. It's hard to grasp, Jesus, why you, why you care so much about us. When we think, I think about John 12, Jesus, where you said that, you know, you do exactly what the Father has told you to do. And so all of your love, all of your compassion, all of your lessons, everything you taught, it is exactly what the Father wanted you to say, how he wanted you to do it. And so that tells us. God Almighty, you care about us so deeply that you will send your son to live out this perfect example for us so that we can have a, an opportunity at this incredible life. And as we talk about this topic today, I, I know we're all at different places. Uh, maybe some of us, are, we've already overcome. Uh, maybe we're overcoming. Maybe we're right in the throes of just feeling like everything's against us. You know, at every turn, there's a challenge. And we have many tests that come to us throughout our days and weeks, months, years, and throughout our lives that challenge us, that press us. And God, I definitely lift up to all of us, God. Uh, you know, uh, I like to say if, we, if we've gone through middle school, we've been traumatized in some way for sure. 
We've got any of us that have been traumatized, whether it's something in our birth, maybe it's abuse, maybe it's assault, maybe it's whatever it is, God. I pray, God, for, for us. But I pray, God, I know it's a difference between having been victimized and, God, the constant self-victimization that we can kind of go through. So help us have great, great perspective to learn of you, to learn from you. Proud us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. What's the first slide here? Next slide. All right, so I got to tell you a story. So I woke up this morning and I thought, okay, probably going to preach this sermon on, you know, but I still had another sermon in my back pocket. And so I'm going to go out to my car, to truck, and I'm going to pick up something. And I walk out to my truck, and all of my doors are open on my truck. Really? Okay, so this is the thing. So it must have been one of you, only one of you. Confess now, give glory to God. And so I, all of my stuff's thrown around. My truck's been moved. And my fob for my truck was in the car. And I never do this. So someone must have gotten into the car, rifled through everything in the car. Everything was thrown everywhere in the car. Found my fob, tried to start the car, saw the truck start. Jumped in my truck because the seat was pulled up and apparently went on a ride and tried to pull it back and didn't park it properly. And I just felt like I've been the victim of something. So I'm looking through everything. Everything's thrown everywhere. And I'm just, you know, I feel violated. And so I've been a victim. And I'm, I've got to get up this morning and preach. And so... I tell Robin what's going on, and Robin goes into, you know, she throws on her cape, you know, and she's going <laughs> and she's gonna help. And I said, I gotta get my sermon ready, I gotta finish this up, blah, blah, blah. And so she started asking me questions, and I'm starting to get upset because she's asking me questions, and I'm already worked up, and I gotta get ready, and I don't have time to deal with this. And so then Robin left, and then she called me, and she said, okay, this is what we need to do. And I'm like really getting upset now. I'll deal with it after church. And so Robin's going on and on and on, and I just I hung up on her. And I sat there because I was in this like, gosh, who would break into my truck after my daughter's wedding? And I immediately began to go, oh, John, there's always something. There's one thing after another. Now, Dan and Julie probably didn't have that response because they're they're better Christians than me. <laughs> At least one of them, and I won't tell you which one. <laughs> it's the one that talks like, no, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Julie and I are kindred spirits. Let's just put it that way. <laughs> uh, and so I'm just frustrated. I'm sitting there, and I got to work on this sermon about victimization, and I'm getting them like, oh, this is... This is a sermon illustration here in the works. You know, you get a sermon illustration, they happen early in the week, not the morning of. I don't need a morning of sermon illustration. And so my wife came home. I apologize. I'm sorry, honey. What a jerk. I'm just whatever. And you know, Robin, she's the real Christian in our household. That's okay. She's going to fix it. She's going to. So she called the cops. She did everything. But I just sat there in that moment and thought, I failed the test this morning. And so I wanted to confess to you that as I preach this, that, you know, I just failed this morning. So I certainly don't have this figured out. And neither do you. Amen? Oh, some of you do. Some of us don't, amen? So I am literally preaching, I sing, I'm preaching to the choir, amen? amen. 2 Kings chapter 5, verse 1. Now Naaman was commander of the army of the king of Aram. He was a great man in the sight of his master and highly regarded because through him the Lord had given victory to Aram. 
He was a valiant soldier, but he had leprosy. Now bands of raiders from Aram had gone out and had taken captive a young girl from Israel. And she served Naaman's wife. She said to her mistress, if only my master would see the prophet who is in Samaria, he would cure him of his leprosy. Naaman went to his master and told him what the girl from Israel had said. By all means, go, the king of Aram replied. I will send a letter to the king of Israel. So Naaman left, taking with him 10,000 talents of silver, 6,000 shekels of gold, and 10 sets of clothing. The letter that he took up to the king of Israel read, With this letter, I am sending my servant Naaman to you, so that you may cure him of his leprosy. As soon as the king of Israel read the letter, he tore his robes and said, Am I God? Can I kill and bring back to life? Why does this fellow send someone to me to be cured of his leprosy? See, I was trying to pick a quarrel with me. When Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his clothes, he sent him this message. Why have you torn your robes? Have the man come to me, and he will know that there is a prophet in Israel. So Naaman went with his horses and chariots and stopped at the door of Elisha's house. Elisha sent the messenger to him to say to him, Go, wash yourself seven times in the Jordan, and your flesh will be restored, and you will be cleansed. But Naaman went away angry and said, I thought that he would surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God, wave his hand over the spot, and cure me of my leprosy. Are not Abana and Farpar, the rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel? So he turned and went off in a rage. He's not upset. In a rage. Name his servants went to him and said, My father, if the prophet had told you to do some great thing, would you not have done it? How much more than when he tells you, wash and be cleansed? So he went down, dipped himself in the Jordan seven times, as the man of God had told him, and his flesh was restored and became clean, like that of a young boy. And the church said, Amen. It's a good story, right? You're going to read it, some phenomenal stuff, some great stuff right before this. But I think there's some really cool lessons here that we can learn from Naaman when it comes to overcoming our victimization. Now, it's important to know that Naaman did have a problem. Leprosy is a brutal disease for which there still there is no real cure. It's brutal. And the way it works is leprosy can start as a little spot. But over time, it spreads. And it spreads and spreads, and then eventually, body parts start to fall off. Fingers, toes, nose, things begin to fall off. And so it's a pretty brutal disease. You go, oh, bro, I just want you to know, God has to look at these pictures all the time. And you just get to look at them this morning, amen? But God sees these all the time, and we want to be like God. Amen? But it's brutal what it does. And so you talk about traumatizing. It eats away. It it affects nerve endings, and it's very painful. It's a brutal, brutal, brutal disease. And you talk about being scarred and traumatized and feeling like, I mean, I'm sure there's more than a few why me moments. I'm not talking about United States of America, pickup truck broke into, why me moments. I'm talking about some intense why me moments. Like, what have you done, God? But Naaman, the Bible says, is an incredible dude. I love how it describes that he's a commander. And it says he's not only a commander who gives order, but he's a great man. He has risen to the ranks of commander. The Bible says he's a great man. 
Then he says he's highly regarded. There's a lot of commanders who are not great and not highly regarded, but he was highly regarded. Said he was a valiant soldier, which means he was really good at his job. He had a flaw. He had this incurable thing. He's also married. So by, by all measures, Naaman's got it kind of made. He's very successful in his life and his career. But you've got this one little problem, you know what I mean? Just one little issue. It's not a little issue, it's a big issue. It's all about perspective, right? Anybody got a perfect life? You got a flaw, you got something going on. And I know somewhere along the line we maybe thought, because we're Americans, things are supposed to be perfect. How dare the pandemic come to America? These gas prices, my goodness. I mean, we're Americans. Golly gee. So hard for us. You know, in our world, you know, if there were 100 people in the world, one of them will go to college. What about your world? Does everybody go to college in your world? So, Naaman's, it's tough, right? It's rough. But I love it here because there's three characters here. Naaman's one of them, but I'll come to Naaman. As I read through this passage, one person jumped out to me that really I, I, I saw in this passage before, and like Dan said, you know, you read through the Bible sometimes and something jumped out there to go, I know that's always been there, but this really jumps out at me. The first, my first point is this, overcome your self-victimization. If you want to overcome Victimhood, overcome your self-victimization. There's a little girl in this story. And what does it say about the little girl? Well, it says this, that some, that some raiders had gone out and kidnapped her. She was a little girl and she was kidnapped. She was kidnapped and she was taken away from her family. Now, let's just, let's just for the sake of saying that Naaman was a good leader, and his mistress was good to her. But who wants to be kidnapped? She's been kidnapped. And she's away from her family. And yet, she, being away from her family, can you imagine what you'd be thinking about the people that kidnapped you? She knows Naaman has leprosy. And instead of her being in her mode of what was me? Poor me. What about my family? What about my people? What about my circumstances? What about my life? No one's ever done anything. She is in the mode of, you know, I know someone who can help Naaman. The guy who can't, I know someone who can help him. And listen, there's no cell phone or text. I don't know way to watch the news. There's a guy, there's a prophet. I've heard there's a prophet, and he will cure him. You're going, little girl, how do you know, how do you know this is going to work out? Because faith helps us overcome self-victimization. Self-victimization is, and imagine if it was the opposite, if she was just into herself. I hope your nose fall off. Your finger's going to fall off. You know what's going to happen next to him. I hope your nose fall off. I hope your fingers fall off. That's what you get. God don't like ugly. That's what you get for kidnapping people. <laughs> but she's not thinking about herself. She's not thinking about her circumstances. How many of us, when we get in the midst of whatever it is, the most uncomfortable of circumstances, we start looking around for people to blame, and we don't think about others. We're too busy thinking about ourselves. But woe is me. That's what I was going through a little bit this morning. I have those moments where, why me? Why me on my daughter's wedding weekend? Why me, God? And I know I, I, know I, I eventually came around. I'm here now. But that first moment of, and I know I can't catch them. I'm walking around, you know, I'm walking around the neighborhood looking for people. Like, they're all going to be outside. Like, 
and there's nobody to find, you know what I mean? Everybody that drives by, I look in their car, trying to see, like, the person who did it is going to show up and go, it was me. And after I went through all of that, I just I sat down and I said, think about, oh, what an inconvenience it's going to be. I got to call AAA, and they're going to have to tow my truck. Poor you. And I even get that free, by the way. <laughs> Self-victimization, right? But when we're faithful, and we're just, we're in touch with God, this little girl, young girl, she's got the faith. The faith to go, you know, I know something great can come out of this. I think there's someone who can heal you. I think there's a way better for you. And I think that there's a prophet who will heal you. Can you be a child of God when the circumstances and situations of life are most unfavorable? Can we be children of God when we're being treated unfairly? Can we be children of God when you no longer have control of, other, of, of what other people do to you or think of you? What they write about you or what they say about you? Can you be a child of God in the most adverse of circumstances that come our way in life, no matter how big they are or how small they are, can we be children of God? When no matter what comes our way, we can always say, but there is a God. I'm not talking about just positive thinking. I'm talking about real faith. There's a God in Israel. And God has people who can do great things. Overcome self-victimization. You know, times are hard. But I believe times will even get harder. Whether the gas prices go down or not, I'm telling you, times will get harder. Trouble will come our way in life. There will continue to be wars and rumors of wars. I'm always shocked. People go, Russia's invading Ukraine. I'm going, that's what people do. They fight. War has been what's always happened. But over in America, we go, oh, my gosh. Can you believe there's war? There will always be war. There's war here at home. There's people getting killed all the time. There's a war going on constantly, and I believe things will continue to get worse, which is why we as disciples, we've got to be more faithful. Are you with me? We can't afford to be victimized ourselves. There is enough trouble in life. Don't victimize yourself. Don't make it worse. Be the kind of people that even your enemies, the worst, those that have done the worst to you or treated you the worst, try to say there is a God that can heal them and make it better. Amen. And if you would only see my God, he will cure you, too, of your leprosy. See, that's the real work we're supposed to be doing, amen? Curing people of their real leprosy, which is a sin. Are you with me? Point two, stop assuming. Stop assuming. You want to overcome victimhood? Stop assuming. The king of Israel, the letter comes, the king of Israel just goes nuts. Ugh. This guy's trying to pick a fight with me. He gets this letter. This letter is the equivalent of that text message or email you get from someone, and you immediately blow up like, what does that mean? <laughs> you ever get an email from someone, you go, oh, yeah? You know what I mean? You start reading into the email or reading into the text. Why they capitalize that? Why they put a period behind that? <laughs> you know, when I text people, I try to do it you know, right? I put periods and people go, oh man, that's aggressive. I'm going, Aggr a period? How can a period be aggressive? <laughs> Talk about reading into things, man. <laughs> that's exactly what the king, he's totally reading into this. He's having a fight before it even starts. I mean, this could have been a full scale war. You know what? Ready the troops. You know what I mean? Like, wait a second. Wait a second. Calm down. This is what we do, though. We, uh, we're all worked up. Someone comes to you and say, I heard this. Oh, yeah? <laughs> you ready to fight? You're angry. You don't need no more information. That was enough. There's plenty of information. 
I'm angry. Even before you get to the person, you're already just like, just say one thing. I will slap the taste out of you. And you're like, <laughs> so worked up already. You ever have that happen? Assuming is the mother of conflict. Assuming is the mother of conflict. And we assume because we're going too fast. And the faster you go, the more you have to assume. The quicker you move in life, the more you have to assume. You just have to assume, 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 assume. You see things on social media. And you get it, you go, you know what happened today? No, no that didn't happen today. Just, let's just see, before you go down that road, okay, maybe there's a few more questions to ask. Before you go into a full-scale war against the person that they're talking about, bad-mouthing them, thinking things about them, that's a war. It's an internal war. And it's a war that's affecting you more than it's affecting the other person right now. But you're just so worked up and so angry. And that's where the king of Israel is. See how he's trying to start a fight with me. Because that's what assumptions do. But you can't overcome victimhood if you're just going to keep assuming. you got to stop assuming. And you got to give the benefit of the doubt and ask a few questions. You ever do that? I know what that means. You know what that is. You know what that's about. You know, you know what they you know what they're like. We do this all the time. We playfully do it sometimes. White people, black people. But behind all of that, right? There's a whole lot of assuming. A lot of assuming. And it's the mother of conflict. It can definitely put you at odds. Oh, there they go. Here they come. Watch them. Look at them. Check them out. So you, you can't overcome your victimhood if you're just going to assume, 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 because then all of them are bad. They're all, write them all off, because they all are out to get me. You know, them. They're kind, those people, church kind, whoever they might be. You figure it out. You know who they are. You know who they are. Might be the neighbor. Might be the whatever. Might be a gender. Might be whatever. But you got to write them all off. When you start assuming, you got to you gotta write them all off. Them Republicans. Them Democrats. Whoever they are. You just assume things about them. And they're all in the same boat. All of them. All them Democrats want to kill babies. They all. They all. That's what they want to do. They kill babies. Watch them. Look at them. They're all killing babies. They can't wait to kill babies. All them Republicans, they're all racist. Every one of them. They're all of them. They're all racist. All of them. You're Republican, you're racist. Don't act like you've never done these, played these ignorant games. And these people you listen to in the media, they know you follow, so they keep going. Yeah. Vote for me. So I can keep power. And they keep telling you, they keep telling you the same thing. And they keep telling you, you're going to change it. You vote for me, we're going to change it. They ain't changing nothing. Right. <laughs> They're not going to change it, okay? Because this Satan likes it this way. He likes all this division and conflict and tension. So he wants you to keep assuming. That's why you, let me give you 24 hours of assumption media. Let me give you, oh, let me give you social versions of it too. Let me just keep you all consumed and assuming things about one another. And then you're all victims. We're all victims. So you want to overcome your victimhood? Stop assuming. Because it just leads to conflict and war. And I love that Elisha sends a therapist to him. And the therapist does a good job. He comes in and he asks a question. Why'd you tear your robes? It's a good therapist, good question. And he says, knock it off. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and you're not a man of God, but there is a man of God in Israel. There's a man of God in Israel. There is a God. So knock all of this nonsense off and just send him to me. Because all you're going to do is stir up a bunch of drama, 
okay? And we're going to have all kind of problems between Israel and Aram that you don't need right now. So knock it off, and let's rely on God. And that's what we're supposed to be, amen? We're supposed to fill that role of the Elisha or the messenger. And we're supposed to go to them and say, okay, so talk to me about what's going on. And why'd you tear your robes? And there's a God in Columbia, amen? Amen. Stop assuming to overcome your victimhood. Point number three. That was two. That was two. Stop assuming it's two. Three is repent of entitlement. Do we have an entitlement slide up there? Uh, repent of entitlement. So now we get to Naaman. And I love it that Naaman, you know, I, I think Naaman takes the word. You got to give him, you know, give him some credits here because in the end he does the right thing. And in the beginning he does the right thing. He knows the situation is desperate. He knows it's bad. It's as is sin. Amen. And I think we see this journey with people even as they come to God in a relationship with God. You go, okay, you know what? I know I need to get this healed. I know I need to get this forgiven. I know I need to get this taken care of. So you may turn yourself in and agree to study the Bible. And, you know, you, you, you bring to God everything. Naming the Bible, I mean, I, I did some research here, and this is supposed to be what he brought was the equivalent of $1 million today. He takes a million dollars because that's what he's supposed to do. He goes, okay, I'm going to go see this guy. I got The gift ushers are in the way for the giver, so I got to bring a gift. And I don't know what he thought the gift was going to do. I, I don't know if he thought, of course, in the end, you know, Elisha doesn't take any of it. I don't want any of it. That's not who I am. Appreciate Elisha. Elisha doesn't even go to see the king of Israel, and he doesn't even want to go out and see Naaman. He doesn't want to be tainted by any of this. I'm on nobody's side. I'm on God's side. I'm not on Aram's side, and I'm not on king of Israel's side. I'm on God's side, amen? And that's a good posture to take if you're a Christian. I'm on God's side. And at the moment you think the side you're on is God's side, you might want to just recheck that, amen? But I love his, you know, Naaman. The girl tells the mistress he can be healed, and so he gets a million dollars together, and he goes. And he takes it to Elijah. <laughs> I could love Elijah. Elijah doesn't even go out. I don't know what Elijah was doing. If he was watching a ball game, I don't know what Elijah yeah. was doing. He's in the house. I'm not even going out there because I don't want the message. To, I don't want the narrative to be that I'm on Aram's side. And why did you heal? Why did you heal the king, the, the best commander? Let him die. Put a curse on him. You know what I mean? But something even great becomes of the story. And so Naaman, he shows up, and as a millionaire would, he expects something. And Elisha doesn't go out. He sends a servant out. And the servant, why do I got to go? Just go tell him. And the servant goes out and goes, he in there, he said, I want to tell you what he said. Don't kill the messenger, okay? He said, Go dip yourself in the Jordan seven times. <laughs> and Elisha gets ticked. What? He didn't even come out here? Are you kidding me? You know who I am? You know who I am? You know what I would d- deserve? You know, you know how incredible I am? People say I'm great. Even your people say I'm great. They will write about me how great I am. I'm entitled for him at least to come out here. I thought he would come out here. I thought he would call on the name of the Lord his God. I thought he would wave his hand over the spot. That's what I thought would happen. Because that's what we do as entitled people. We not only assume... But we expect really, really great things to happen in our lives. See, we, at the end of the day, we all think we're pretty awesome. We do. We think we're pretty amazing. My professor said about our kids, the older people, you know, because we were part of that generation. If you're Gen X or older, we told our kids, you're awesome. You're amazing. I love you. My professor said, you know the problem with our kids today? You know why they're entitled? We told them they were awesome, and they believed us.
Your parents told you you were awesome, and you believed them. You're not that awesome. <laughs> but our God is awesome. He can move mountains. You know the song. Amen. So he, was, he felt like, what, what is this? But thank God that he had people around him. And see, you need good people around you. Because when you go through all these phases in life for your self-victimization and your assuming and your entitlement, it's good to have some people in your life to come along and go, what's the matter with you? What's the matter with you? Come on. If you were told to do something complicated, would you not have done it? If you were told to do some complex things, would you not have done it? If God would have said, I want you to run three miles, and then I want you to climb a tree and do this, wouldn't you not have done it? And see, sometimes it's just simple humility that is necessary. Simple humility that will lead to simple obedience, okay, which is, a, which is necessary for us to get cleansed or overcome our victimhood, or in this case, leprosy. Of the service, they come. I think they let him calm down a little bit. Then they came and said, come on. Far, par. That's a, that's a long way off. You don't want to go there. He just said, go to the Jordan. And the Jordan was a nasty, dirty river. It's nasty. And he goes, I don't want to get in there. But he told you to do it, so why not do it and be cleansed? And I love Naaman. He responds well in the end. In the end, he goes. He humbles himself. He's obedient, and the Bible says his skin was healed. We're stored like that of a boy. Isn't that awesome? But man, when we live entitled lives, when we act like it's supposed to go exactly the way we want it to go, when perfection or our ideal of perfection or our deal of the best, when that becomes sort of the enemy of good enough, amen? And I love to come and talk about good enough Christianity sometime, amen? But when it becomes the em- enemy of that, then we just live these entitled lives. And it's such a struggle. And we just beat ourselves down in the world, Christians, as difficult as it can be for us already. I mean, there's so many things out there that are pressing in and against us. And so I want to encourage you this morning that let's overcome our victimhood. And I'm telling you, maybe you didn't find yourself today, but I'm telling you, as you go through life, you're going to feel those moments. And maybe it'll be something small like I dealt with this morning. But it's in those small things that you show God that you're faithful. It's in those little things. It's in those little moments, okay, when you're thinking about yourself and you're not thinking about others. Those are the moments. Instead, let's think about others. Even those that are less. If, you're, if you voted one way or another way, try to have a compassion for the other side. If you think a different let's show a little compassion and love and respect for others. That's what Christians are supposed to be doing, amen? We're not supposed to be putting each other down, amen, putting down. We're all, we, we are humans. We're made in the image of God, all of us. And so when you demonize any made in God's image, well, you're saying God's got a problem. I don't think God likes that, amen. So let's stop the self-victimization. Let's stop the assuming, and let's put an end to the entitlement, because that way we can overcome our victimhood. God bless you. Good to be with you. Turn the AC back down. This. <laughs> oh man, I it is it is really a uh, a treat to a, any chance we get to hear hear Vince speak, and uh, I'm so grateful you came back, bro, to 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 preach the word to us this morning. And um, for those of you that don't know, I'm Davion Hambrick, and I, I moved here six years ago, 
And uh, Vince actually hired me to go into the full-time ministry and was my uh, first mentor in the ministry and, and really helped me a lot to uh, mature and, and grow in my faith and my character. And um, as he was preaching, you know, I was just thinking back to, to all of the discipling times that we would have, um, all of the things that he was, he was trying to, you know, train me up in, in my character. And uh, I remember this one specific time, thinking about victimhood, and, and you know, I really battled with my purity. And uh, I, I was in Texas at the time, and I called him on the phone. I was getting open because I, you know, gave in to sin. And, you know, I was just like, oh, I just feel so helpless, and I feel so embarrassed, and this, this, and that. And I just feel like I have no control or no power over, you know, how things turn out for me. And, uh, you know, I remember him saying, well, just stop. <laughs> and I was like, oh, that's it. Like, I could just, just stop it. You know, that's what he said. Just stop it. You know, it's kind of like what the dude said to Naaman. Like, what are you doing? You know, and, um, you know, it's, it's a really simple thing. But I think the implications of that, you know, really what he was saying is like, stop being a victim. Like you have the, the opportunity, you have the ability to be in control of how you live your life. Uh, the decisions that you make, you, you have control over those decisions. And, you know, I think about the, the three things, right, how to overcome faith and, and assuming and entitlement. Um, and those were all things that I either lacked or I did. I did a lot of assuming. You know, I felt very entitled. It's like, God, well, I've been a Christian. Why haven't you fixed me? You know, it shouldn't be hard. You know, so fix me. Um, but really, you know, I, I, I just kind of kept myself in that victim mentality. And, uh, you know, Vince really helped me to overcome that and to be a man of purity and a, and a man of faith today. Um, and so I just feel, you know, I think as you were sharing, I felt grateful uh, for God, bro, and how he spoke through you. Um, but also how he used you in my life to, to help me to become a man that's good enough to be a husband to an awesome wife. And, you know, but ultimately a man that can, can take control of his life, not be a victim and, and live a life that's pleasing to God. So I appreciate the call. I appreciate the challenge, uh, the encouragement, and I'm just really, really grateful that you, that God put that word on your heart and that you shared. So give it up for another round of applause.